jump in motocross news. Hello and welcome to another GetDrop.com podcast. I'm Jonathan McCready and with me is Andy McKinstry. And this week we're going to talk about the AMN Nationals, kind of a review of the championships. And we'll have to start with the 250s because Jet Lawrence, which I think is a pretty amazing story, came from Australia, very, very young kid, moved to Europe, rode EMX 85, EMX 250, and now he's went to America. And at 18 years old, he's the 250 US National Champion. And he had, <laughs> it wasn't that easy for him. It looked like it was going to be a, fair, a foregone conclusion. You thought he'd do enough in the first moto to get the job done or he'll just need a couple of points in the second moto. But he crashed in practice. He crashed twice in the first moto and he crashed again in the second moto. So it made it exciting to watch, but I'm sure a bit nerve-wracking for him. But he, he kept his composure when he really had to to, to, to take the title. It was only six points in it in the end. Justin Cooper rode flawless, a 1-1. He, I'm sure, wanted more of that, but he admitted after that a broken thumb at that fateful crash at, at Washougal, which really turned the whole championship around with hindsight. Um, that that really killed him and, and hurt his results for the next few races. So Jet Lawrence did what he had to do in the second second race after yet another crash when he went to the back of uh, Max Voland. He got the job done, and I think a wee bit of symmetry as well was Hunter Lawrence third overall. A couple of moto wins for him as well, maybe not the end of the season he wanted, but first and third for the Lawrence brothers, after everything they've done and been through coming from Australia, it's, it's a pretty amazing story, Andy. Absolutely. Uh, you, uh, you reflected on it well there. Uh, coming in the weekend, you know, looked like Jet Lawrence had it done and dusted, but just goes to show it's never over until the fact that he sings. That he made it hard work, like especially in that first moto. Obviously, the, the second, um, well, I was going to say crash, but he didn't even really crash. Uh, just the rider crashed in, in front of him and then, he was able to save it, but he still lost a load of time behind the, the other rider. But not much you can do about that one, but it just goes to show when you put yourself in a bad position, these sort of things can happen in this sport. But obviously, he done really well to come back to eighth. And then the second moto got a bit of a better start and just brought it home for third, really. And yeah, it was, uh, I think uh, we forget sometimes that he's still only 18 years old, but sometimes you need reminding and uh, I think that weekend it just reminds us that he's still only 18 and got a long long way to go but at the same time his current level is fantastic and to win this championship is you know you have to think is it's the first of many he could he has the potential if he stays injury free to dominate in America for for a long time to go really it was it's actually quite funny watching him and Max Volan battle in the second moto because obviously Volan's rated quite highly and he is a good young talent but we forget sometimes that he's actually, I think, older than Jet. So it just goes to show yeah. how much talent and speed Jet Lawrence has. Yeah, I think Jet Lawrence is the next big thing over there. He's already being marketed as that with the, the team behind him, with Red Bull and whoever else with the donut thing. And he's he has the personality to back it up. But he showed this season, especially outdoors, and even at the last at the last round there, because things could have unraveled pretty quickly for him but he with all those crashes but he regrouped had the mental composure and obviously the, the talent isn't in question the way he rides the bike is really perfect a wee bit like the way Stefan Everton Jorge Prado ride very inch perfect and, and a lot of momentum and, and standing up but he showed he has the Milton mental resilience to overcome even problems whenever you have that pressure on where he's expected to win and things started to go wrong he came through that and that's probably a big learning experience for him as well for whatever he does next. And he actually admitted in his, his the media interview after that something that Stefan Everts, who he, he worked with a wee, a wee bit whenever he was in the 80s, I think he rode with Liam as well, that Everts mentioned about not trying to move too fast, don't go faster than the clock's t- ticking. And he was trying to tell that to Hunter because Hunter has a tendency to, to go for broke a lot of times, especially whenever he was in GPs and even a bit in America, to almost calm down and, and wait for your time and not to kind of run before you can walk. So Jet is obviously a good listener. He's had Stefan Everts in his area, Ken Roxon's dad, he said his own father, and he's currently Johnny O'Mara. So along with the talent and the riding style and the technique, he said a lot of people helping him, a lot of very experienced people. You don't get much better than Stefan Everts and, and Johnny O'Mara. And of course, Ken Rocks has dad lived it with Ken already and is apparently very good on, on shifting places and where you need to shift in the power of the bike. So he's a lot of people behind him to instruct him. And it looks like he, he listens to those people and doesn't just rely on his own, own talent and, and stubbornness as such. So it looks like he's he's all the right components in his corner. He has the talent, he has the ability to listen and learn. 
And he's obviously a smart rider and is able to adapt to situations. As we saw this year, he produced wins when he had to produce wins after a slump. And even with the crashes under pressure at the last round, he still did enough to, to do it. But sometimes, as great as Jed is, I feel Tom Vial is kind of similar in, in the World Championship, but he just doesn't have that marketing people behind him because Tom rides very similar to Jet with, with the precision and his, his, the age is very similar as well. And for me, those two, you know, Maxime Renault stepping up at the minute, but for me, those two are the next two big things coming through in, in, in motocross, the Australian and the Frenchman. Absolutely. I, th- I think you're spot on there. Um, obviously, with Jet, uh, he- he, he's got everything you mentioned, but he's also still young as well with being 18. And when you look at the other American youngsters coming up, yes, they've got talent, but even though Jet's young, I think the one thing, the, one of the best decisions they made was leaving Amer- leaving their home country and coming to the Grand Prix at an early age and riding, you know, GP tracks, rough tracks. And uh, I'd give him more experience then whenever he did go to America. He had the experience of racing in Australia and in Europe, uh, all and, and all around the well, all around the world in the MX250 Championship as well, and um, I think that was just the best um, learning experience for him. I would have liked to see him stay in GPs a little bit longer, but obviously then he, he went in over to America and rode the amateur stuff for a year before he went pro. And again, that would have even though he wasn't racing in the GP paddock then, at least he had a year over there before he jumped into it. So. He, he would have been riding the practice tracks and stuff and adapting quickly. So, yeah, in terms of the career choices they've made so far, they've, you would have to say they've got it right on reflection. But like you said, Tom Vial, Maxime Renault and 100% Yago Gertz, I'd love to see him up against those three every week. <laughs> yeah, that would, that's the one problem with, with the motocross of nations and the COVID situation and everything mid-season. Everything has had to happen this year because a normal year you might have seen Yago Gertz, Tom Vial and, and Jet Lawrence all go head to head in the MX2 class and that really would have been something something worth watching, I think. I'm not sure you could say who the the winner would have been. Maybe Vial, Jet starts can be a wee bit hit and miss, but I think those two are, are very special talents. And it's just to see them we're, we're not gonna get to see the two of them go head to head at the nations this year. Absolutely, it's a shame, but let's hope for next year things are a bit more normal and we can see a problem with across the nations be pretty cool to see Jet with another year's experience and then um, Gertz uh, back to himself next year hopefully and then Maxime Renault who knows he could be world champion this time next year and improve even more and then Tom Vial all four of them You mentioned Max Volan there and for me ninth overall his first full season I thought that was that was pretty impressive I don't think he was necessarily expected to do a lot this year because I know Talon wanted to give him get a longer deal because he was going pro maybe a bit earlier than, than they thought. But ninth overall, he led some laps. He had a good good last round there at Hangtown, which is his home home track. I know Talon was very fast there as well. Ninth overall for Mac Vaughan. He done well. Austin Faulkner seventh. Probably better than, than it was looking for Austin Faulkner. He ended up probably being a more or less top five guy in the last few few rounds. He had the DNF there in the first moto at Hangtown. But another standout for me, I think, and maybe aside from, from Jet, was Joe Shimoda, fifth overall, probably one of the standout performers of the season. Started not slowly, but okay, and just seemed to get better, progressively better. At the end of the season, he was a real threat for the podium. Yeah, Shimoda definitely has impressed me. I think he's impressed everybody, really, because we all know he wasn't really signed to be their number one rider. But, you know, he's he's came in, done his job really well, worked hard, it's pretty clear to see. And he's got the ability, so he's able to learn off the, the faster, maybe more faster riders quite quickly. So he's been able to learn all the time, really. And, yeah, and to end the season with a second overall tank time is very, very impressive, going 4-2 there. So this year, the one thing is he was coming in with maybe little pressure. What he needs to now do is deliver under the pressure because going into next year, you know, he's probably he's he was the main guy this year. He's probably going to be expected to be the main guy next year for them with another winter under his belt. So it'll be interesting to see how he can cope with the pressure now because he'll have a bit more going into 2022 than he did have this year. And another guy we should mention before we go to the 450s is, is Dylan Schwartz. Tenth overall in that Suzuki, along with Shimoda, he's probably been one of the big big surprises. So definitely big round of applause for him. He's been fantastic this year, and I'm not sure if he's actually ended up 
going to end up on a sort of higher level ride or not. I think the, the teams are pretty full, but if anyone deserves a shot on a on a factory husky or or something like that, I think it's I think it's Dylan Dylan Schwartz. So what Josh Burris could do on that bike whenever he got the opportunity at the end at the end of the season there. So for me, it'd be very interesting to see Dylan Schwartz on on the next level machinery, and we probably should talk Rick Elzinger as well. Very unfortunate. Well, first of all, a very unlikely trip to America for the for the last two rounds. Somebody saw our interview on Gitrop, put it on Vital MX, and then Brent Norman, an American guy who lived near Palace, saw the whole thing and basically financed a large part of the opportunity for him to get over along with Rick's sponsors to make everything happen. And at Pali, he was riding very well. He was top 15 both motos, but the, the fuel boiled and he got fuel in his mouth in the first one, and that made him a bit ill for the second one. And that, I'm sure, along with 100 degree heat, didn't make things easy. So he ended up having the DNF both motos there, but got points at Hangtown a little bit more hard pack. So not exactly Dutch sand Hangtown was, but he still got 16th overall. And if he'd been able to finish both motos at, at Pala, I think overall it would have been a really productive and I'm sure very enjoyable week there doing, doing two rounds of the, of the US Nationals and I think he's he hasn't done himself any harm at all he's got his name on, on the map out there Absolutely, uh, it was just a pity what happened to him really at Pala because I think he could have got at least one top 15 moto result there for sure because um, I think it, one of the motos he passed quite a he passed a number of riders to get himself into 13th I think and was looking good so I'm sure even if the fuel thing didn't happen, he probably still would have faded with the heat. But I think he could have been capable of getting the top 15 there. At Hangtown, I have to say the AMA footage is usually very, very good. But this last two weeks, I'm not quite sure what's been happening on the leaderboard. Um, so we don't really know where he started because that was non-existent. So it, it, God knows in that one. But for him to go 17 and 16, a good learning experience at not a a typical track for that he would usually perform really at a high level at, plus being on a stock bike, not ideal. But, you know, to get points in both motos, I think, and, and the learning experience he got, it's only positive, I think. I mean, if he went into MX2 tomorrow and got 17, 16, he would probably be happy enough with that as an MX2 GP debut as well. Yeah, and I'm sure it gives them confidence as well going back in the MX250, but more importantly, the MX2 World Championship. Not. The U.S. Nationals generally have a good field of, of 250 young riders as well. And I think he's shown that, especially if you put him on a similar bike to what a lot of those American youngsters were on, that he wouldn't be far away. He isn't far away from, from their talent and speed level, just transplanting into that series with no kind of experience, really, of, of what it's all about in America. So I think for the rest of his career, it might open a few doors in America. You never know, and I'm sure going into the World Championship too, it's kind of maybe settled a few nerves and given some self-belief. Yeah, absolutely. One thing is, if he was ever doing it again, it would be nice to see him not on a stock bike because I feel like with so many factory bikes over in America, you need to have a good engine stock. It's very, very difficult because your start's not going to be good. And with there so, being so many factory bikes, it gives those riders an advantage. Plus they're in their home country as well to add on top of that. So, I feel like it's very difficult to do on the stock bike, and that's why you know he, he didn't do any himself any harm. Seventeen, sixteen, not bad at all for a second professional race ever. No, and just to have the experience of racing and living and training and riding in California and, and doing those couple of U.S. nationals, there are a lot of people watch the series in America, so to get to live that and experience it and, and race race those riders again, as I'm sure something he'll, he'll always remember. But well, moving on to the, to the 450 class, and again, talking of dreams and making things come true, Dylan Ferrandes did just that with a 450 national title. And he actually said, while he thought he could do it in the 250 division, he didn't think he could do it on a 450. Now, this is outdoors, of course, so it's something you might be expecting to be more competitive in, given his background of World Championship motocross. But he was, without doubt, the, the best rider. Yes, on his day, Ken Roxon could win, and on his day, Eli Tomac could win, or Sexton, or Cincerillo. But Ferrandis on his day was able to win and his bad days were not very bad at all. The, the damage he was able to minimise by coming through the pack or just taking a smart third, fourth or fifth always played to his favour. He had no big dramas really. And then on his day, he was actually unstoppable with his late motor surges. He kind of turned into a bit of a French Eli Tomac at times. Yeah, absolutely. Um, really, really good. And, you know, he didn't even have to go out and win that, but it goes to show how much he wants to win and he really wanted to end the season on a high. 
very very good performance first moto was good and not second moto but it was it was very very good i mean i know there isn't a lot of depth in that class at the moment but the problem is the first four were completely gone because of that and the way he was able to charge through the field and catch those guys very 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 impressive another lap he, he might have even um, uh, caught on web as well who knows but he was really putting a charge in it was very impressive to watch it was and um, Roxon I think he had to feel sorry for Ken Roxon he was really close to the Supercross title until the very end and he was pretty close to the Motocross title to lead that DNF I think at Millville and he still come back strong he the heat there but he rode well in the, in the first moto at Hangtown this obviously at, at the end got him, but he'd actually beat Tomac, so it looked like he was all but secure in that second in the points, and then he got his foot caught in Cody's shock spike, barely even got to turn one, had to pull off, he thought it was broken. Turned out, thankfully, not to be broken, but it cost him second in the points. I'm sure it cost him a fair bit of money as well, but really, overall, he deserved to be second, and just to have that third place, these end the end of season scenarios for Ken Roxon are still still there, even if that last moto wasn't his fault at all. He's got to end the season happy with what he's done, but frustrated that the season end and standings probably don't reflect how good he was this season. He really deserved yeah. that second. Yeah, very, very frustrating. I mean, he had second in the bag there, but go, it just goes to show, as we were saying earlier with Jet Lawrence, you just don't know what's around the corner in this sport, but it is typical Ken Roxon luck, isn't it? Just uh, very, very, very unfortunate and nothing much you can do about that one. But at least it happened at the last round, I suppose, in the last moto. So even though he lost second uh, in the championship, you know, he doesn't have to worry about being fit for the for another round of AMA and next weekend or whatever. And he can just take his time and get healthy again now. But very, very unfortunate. You have to feel sorry for the guy there. But oh, well, that's just a sport, I'm afraid. These things can happen, but very, very bad luck. And it, it should have really been a year or one too, but... Oh, well, two of them in the top three is not too bad. Yeah, there's actually one American in the top three in the 450s with Tomac and one in the 250s with, I forgot his name now, Justin Cooper. So that's not, not ideal for America. And that kind of, we'll talk about Eli Tomac first, actually. He he circled his Kawasaki career very nicely to end with a, a Moto victory his last day at Kawasaki, but also his last day for his mechanic. So I think it was nice in many ways that he went out on top as such with, with a moto win. He's had a brilliant career overall, but a brilliant career with Kawasaki. Finally got that Supercross title, three outdoor 450 championships. And yes, he's moving on to Star Yamaha, but it's going to be difficult to replicate the, the, the success he's had with, with Kawasaki. And in some ways it was nice for him, nice for his mechanic and nice for the team to, to go out with that, with that moto win, I thought. Yeah, it was nice for him to go out with a moto win, but you have to say, he's, at the same time, he's probably got it. He didn't get the overall. I mean, it looked for all the world he was going to win the overall, and then Fernandez just sliced his way through the field, and even though he was getting up through them quickly, it just looked like the first four were gone, but he was able to make it happen, and Tomac, I'm sure, would have probably been a wee bit frustrated if he knew you know, what had happened, but obviously he was just focusing on himself, and, and he done all he could do in the second moto there to get the win, Obviously, the first moto, it was looking like he was on the charge. Then the mistake dropped into fourth. And, you know, it was maybe actually the first moto that probably cost him the overall because, you know, it looked for all the world like he was going to maybe re- recharge the batteries and, and catch where, but it just never really happened and he never really recovered. So he probably actually lost the overall in the first one. But, yeah, for him to end his Kawasaki career in a moto and still isn't too bad at all and the clinch second in the championship. Right, so on to this American scenario, they didn't win either national title. Obviously, there's a lot of guys hurt in the 450 division, and Jeremy Martin got hurt in the in the 250 class. But regarding the, the motocross of nations, initially it was said that they weren't coming because of COVID, and that, of course, is partly right. But we've seen the ISD team, the E team come. with some Mike Brown, Sean Hamblin, all there at the Farley Motocross of Nations, which, by the way, Northern Ireland won. So massive congratulations Woo-hoo. to them. Didn't ever think Northern Ireland would beat America and Britain and Belgium and Holland and all, and all those countries. So superb from Neville Bradshaw, Gordon Crocker, Tommy Merton and Trevor Cubitt. Big round of applause for them. Three, three of those guys in, in the top 10. So fantastic, fantastic weekend for, for, the, for those riders. And yes, it's the, it's the vet motor across the nations, but for a country with a population of one, about one and a half million, to, to do that at, on any level is, is pretty fantastic. 
Whereas America, 300 million in their population generally. And you had Roger DeCoster literally saying, who, who can we bring to this motocross of nations? Which I thought was, was pretty unbelievable. Now, surely Cooper Webb, Michael Moserman and RJ Hampshire could have come and, and, and put a decent team in and, and performances in at, at Mandeva. But it looks like Roger DeCoster wants to go with the team he thinks can win and, and potentially rival Holland and Italy or just don't go at all, especially with the COVID scenario and the amount of money it takes. But to me, they probably still could have gone with a, a half-decent team. I'm sure most of them are, are Jay Hamster. It would have been good on, on a 450, even you, even if you discount Barsha and Saxon, who were originally supposed to be going on, on the team. Yeah, it's a bit of a strange one. You know, he doesn't want to come now because he knows 100% they're going to get beat pretty much. But, I mean, even with the A team, Yes, they've got a chance of winning, but they're probably still going to beat anyway. They haven't won the event for, what, nine years? So it's, it's, it is a strange one, but um, it is what it is. I thought they would have actually came this year because obviously the Motocross Nation event is, is supposed to be in America next year. So I thought they might have came, made an effort to come this year. So it meant 100% they will get the event back next year because, you know, when the event's in America, everyone treats it completely different over there. They'll be lining up the ride there next year if it does happen. But I do wonder now if in front will maybe change your minds on that one because America didn't actually support the event this year. It'll, it will be very interesting, that one. Yeah, it's, it's quite a curious scenario, the way it all fell. And obviously COVID was, is a big problem. And for a lot of GP teams, the, the, the timing of the event, which no one could really help. But it was, I thought Roger DeCoster's quotes were interesting that he was basically admitted he was struggling to pick riders that could form a competitive team, competitive in terms of obviously being able to challenge for the win because you would think that every other country's depleted, I think, except for Holland and Italy on, on some level. So there were America were kind of in the same boat as everyone else, but unfortunately they're, they're not showing up and... Uh, it, it definitely does take a bit of prestige or at least a bit of interest and excitement away from the event. And there was already enough of that dispersed with the, the some of the top GP men not riding. But we still have Ste- our Stefan Everett's son, Liam. He's going to be competing in it and a few other storylines to to look at. But it's just it's not going to be the same, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. It's just going to be like an international race now, really, um, which is fine. But it's not the motor across the nations, is it? You know? At least at the motocross the nations, you get the the elite GP guys there every year, and then you get the best in America and Australia too usually. But not to be this year, bit of a shame. But oh well, it'll still be still be watching it and seeing how Team Ireland do with after their controversial pick to see how they get on. Yeah, I think enough's been said on that one. Only don't you get all oh, uh, oh, oh, frustrated one, again? What <laughs> one question though? Did you see the results in Holland at the weekend? Jack Sheridan was riding. Yeah, I heard, I heard you were saying he's had a lot of practice at Mantova as well. Yeah, apparently he's been riding at Mantova ever since. And then he was riding in Holland at the weekend, which is actually quite good. I like to see Irish riders riding internationally. That's what they need to do. But he was, I think, eight seconds a lap off Marcel Conan, who's not a bad MX250 rider. And obviously it's good to see Jake Sheridan riding at those events. But I'm not sure how being eight seconds a lap off him weren't getting picked for Team Ireland. But... It is what it is. It would have been interesting to see Martin Barr race the same event, I think, even on a on a two fifty for comparison. But if Jack's been riding Mantaval a lot, that's going to be, give him the best chance, which is all you can ask. I think there he's going to put one hundred and ten percent in, as well. Jason Mayer and Stuart Edmonds, and with the the depleted field, there there's a chance, especially if Edmonds and Mayer ride right to their potential, Ireland could have a good result. I think. Yeah, absolutely. It'll be good to see those two. They have been riding good this year, especially Stuart Edmonds. He's been very, very impressive. Usually he takes half the season to get up to speed and then he usually really ends strong. But right from the get-go this year, he's been um, running really well. I think I think it's been the preseason in Spain. He was only supposed to spend a couple of weeks there, but then when COVID hit, he decided to stay. So COVID probably done him a favour. Much better preparation over there and riding the, the Spanish tracks and even racing in Spain helped him and Jason Muir, he's a bit different from Edmonds because he had a, an injury at the start of the season. Took him a while to get into it, but he's really turned a corner this last six, seven weeks and he's battling for top 10 uh, MX1 British Championship results now, which is great to see. Yeah, and before we get to the, to the British Championship, the final round at Landrick, just a word on Max Anstey, 11th overall. Not a bad end of the season. He was really going fast there at, at Hangtown. He was actually running with 
was it Roxon, Webb, Webb and Tomac, or was that the second moto? Uh, yes, yeah, second moto. Ferrandis came from way back to ultimately pip him, pip him and Craig at the end. But it was Anstey, Taylor and Craig with Tomac and, and Webb up front. The four of them were going, and that was one of the first times really this year that Anstey's been on the pace of that lead group. And he hung well there for about for 15 minutes anyway. So apparently the Suzuki team have got things figured out a wee bit better with, with suspension and Nancy's feeling a bit more comfortable. But that looks to be his last race on, on the yellow bike and there's talk he's going to the Rocky Mountain ATV KTM team for next season, which to me is, is would be fantastic for Anstey because I think he's shown enough talent even there that second moto. If you give Anstey a bike he's comfortable on, he's going to be good outdoors and he's going to have hopefully great motos. And in Supercross, he showed that he can ride it and he can in a very competitive class. So give him a better team as such, a team with more experience indoors and out and a bike that he was good on in, in Grand Prix racing with the, the KTM Husqvarna platform. This could be the thing Anstey needs to really show his potential, even indoors, but especially outdoors next season. Yeah, what I would say on Anstey is obviously 11th in the championship. That's, he would usually be around there in MXGP. I think his best MXGP championship classification was ninth. But what you would say in MXGP, he's always had the best equipment pretty much. So to finish 11th in AMA on a non-factory bike, the Suzuki, I think isn't too bad on reflection. Um, it was good to see him get that good start in the second motor of Hangtown. And like you said, for 15 minutes, he was running the pace. I know things half got better in the Suzuki, but compared to those factory bikes, I still thought it was the suspension wasn't quite as good as those factory bikes. It seemed still seemed to be moving quite a lot and throwing about a bit, but the pace was good and he looked a lot more comfortable. So it was a good way to end the season. And Rocky Mountain KTM thinks he'd be a good fit there, a step up for Anstey and one that he probably deserves because even without the best equipment, he still he still had some pretty good results and. Um, Hopefully, he can make progress in the KTM, have a good, strong off-season. Who knows what can happen, but hopefully he can be, be at least a top 10 consistent rider. Yeah, and sticking with the British theme, but moving to the British Championship, Landrek was on at the weekend, and it was a nail-biter between Tommy Searle and Harry Kulas coming in, level on points. But actually, in the two races, Kulas never really got close to Tommy Searle. He didn't quite get the starts Tommy got, and Tommy, I think, was just flat-out faster on the day. He rose to the rose to the occasion, got his I think it was his first moto win of the season, unbelievably, in that first moto. But what a time to do it, right? When the pressure's on. And that's the thing with Sir. He has that talent, he has the ability, but he has the self confidence to le- deliver when it really matters. Backed it up with a third and the second moto cool has got an even worse start. I thought maybe it was gonna be a wee bit closer, there was gonna be a bit of bar banging, but you have to hand it to Tommy Searle. Champions rise under pressure, and, and Sir did just that to, to clinch the championship. So, a big round of applause for him. That was a fantastic performance under the situation he was in. Yeah, I feel like Tommy Sir of today doesn't take the risks that he would have done once, and especially when it, when he was in MXCP. But you know, do not take these risks and still win a British championship. It just goes to show, and he showed it at the weekend. Whenever he needs that speed, he still has it in the locker. So it was good to see him get a moto win and, and clinch the title. I think on reflection, him winning the British Championship and Harry Kulas winning the MX Nationals, one each. Hard to argue with that, really. Both had good seasons and Kulas obviously had a great season too and pushed Searle all the way. But on reflection, I think that was fair and both had great seasons. Yeah, and Harry Kulas, as you mentioned, has had a, a brilliant season. He's been riding all sorts of national championships and, and being at the front of them all. And I'm sure he'll put in a great performance in, in the Nations in a couple of weeks as well. At Cab Screens Yamaha, the present Cab Screens Yamaha team has been very good. And they seem to gel with Harry as well. So bike team, rider, everything seems to be going on well there. And yes, there might be a small bit of regret at how that last round in, in the Revo British Championship went. But to get that MX Nationals Championship win and to go toe-to-toe with, Sammy, with Tommy Searle for the title, given what Tommy's done in his career, I think that they have to pat themselves on the back, even though the result maybe didn't go their way. But into MX2 and Conrad Muse, it was a foregone conclusion. Muse is simply on another level to, to everyone else, and, and they dominated again. But great for Roger McGee and the Hitachi Field by Milwaukee KTM team. They are just eating British championships for breakfast at the minute. The last oh, over a decade, I think now, this seems just to pick the right riders, get these British championships down. But for Conrad Muse, the rest of the season, 
it's all about the world championship and he has the motor across the nations there as well at Mantova, which really should suit him and give him a chance to, to show his skills again. But this world championship, it's time now that he can produce this consistently, this British form consistently on the, on the world stage. Everyone knows he has the ability and the British championship's out of the road now. He can take confidence from that. He's a two-time British champion. Now let's see this in the world stage. Yeah, just before touching MX2, a shout out to Evgeny Bobashev actually, who mm-hmm. actually won at Landrake. Nice to see the old dog or, and the tough nuts uh, get back to the top. Again, he's another rider that has speed when he needs it and it feels like it's been a while since he's won, so it was good to see him go 2-1 at the weekend. And yeah, on MX2, Conrad Muse just simply on another level. Uh, ridiculous speed in England. Everyone knows it. Great to see him win another British title, but now the focus needs to be in, a, uh, in the MX2 World Championship for him and try and just get this podium, get the monkey off his back, and hopefully it can be a domino effect. But if he can ride the same uh, in the GPs as he does in England, there's no reason why he can't do it. But if it's a mental issue, I'm not quite sure, or if it's just starts or what the issue is. But hopefully we can see his full potential in the GP soon because time is ticking, you would say. Yeah, he has to start delivering. And now with the British Championship gone, one, I should say, not gone, that he can put all his focus into the, the last sort of eight, eight Grand Prix of the year on this motocross of nations. It's probably kind of working out perfect for him. All the, most of the rest of the race are in Europe and Italy. So it looks like he's going to be at all those rounds. I know with British Championship clashes and one thing and another, he's missed it. He hasn't really got into the swing of the Grand Prix. He, and it was kind of unfortunate for him because he was coming off the back of a good result. But we'll transition to, to Raiola here and stay with Muse. For Muse, Raiola is probably the best sort of round he could have hoped for. He's brilliant in the sand. He's coming off a British Championship. And if he can get the starts, I would expect him to be up around, up around that, that top five level on MX2. Yeah, I think he's going to need the starts for sure because the top 10 is very close in MX2 at the minute. So f- for sure, he's going to need to start. I think if he can get the start, he, ha- he can stay in the top 10. Can he get into the top five? At this moment in time, difficult to say. This The level in MX2 is very impressive this year. So hard to say, but I think if he gets fifth to 10th, that's a very good speed. And, and, after, not, and after not riding a GP for a while, you'd probably have to take that and then try and progress from there. I'm sticking with MX2. Feels like a, a big moment for, for Iago Gertz. He's had an, an extra what week to 10 days to get some bike, some off-the-bike training done after the arm pump surgery and the difficulties he had in Turkey. Back in the sand. We've said his World Championship hopes are almost all but over, but this is the one round where he can try and reignite those hopes. He's probably going to have to go 1-1 one, one or hope something happens to, to Renault. Very crucial round for him if he even wants to have a glimmer of a shot at this World Championship. Absolutely. Uh, he is capable of going 1-1. Will he do it? It's another question. Iago likes to have 100% preparation. And without that, it can't, his riding can't suffer at the GP sometimes, as we've seen in Turkey. But hopefully he's 100%. We can see the real Iago Gertz because if the real Iago Gertz shows up, then you do have to fancy fancy him to, to get at least the overall win, whether it'll be a 1-1 or not, who knows. But he should be very good at that track. San, it should get rough. So, yeah, I feel like he's the best sand rider in the class. So it just it just depends on his preparation and how, how he's feeling. But fingers crossed that we'd, as a neutral, it would be quite good to see him go 1-1 and try and claw his way back in this championship because at the minute it's hard to see anybody getting close to Renault. So... It might start to lose interest if the championship chase doesn't help, you know. Yeah, and Renault's pretty good on, on every surface now, so I don't expect a big drop off from him, even if he doesn't win. Tom Vial proved in Ballon he could win in the deep sand, so expect him to be challenging at the front. He's just good everywhere. And also the, the wild card as such as, as Kai De Wolf. He showed he can win in the sand already. If he gets the starts on that track's very gnarly, he should be pretty impressive to watch in the bumps. I'm really looking forward to see him go up against Gertz and Vial in particular, but also, as you mentioned, it's a pretty deep field anyway, but maybe those three are would be the three favourites for the for the victory. And the Wolf going up against those two in a straight-up race could be pretty exciting to watch. Yeah, it should be. I'd say I think you're spot on. The top three you would expect would be Vial, Renault, Gertz. Who knows what order? It's that close at the minute, and it depends on the start because... The speed's quite similar between those three. And yeah, the Wolf's the wild card, really. Uh, he'll just be out pinned and who knows what could happen with him. He rides with the heart in his sleeve. So 
certainly wouldn't rule out him getting another Moto in or whatever because he, he has the talent and he's very, very good in sand. So it should be interesting. be interesting to see what Matty Guardanini can do this weekend as well. Second still in the World Championship standings and he's a regular podium guy now. Coming into the season, you might not have thought that, but you know he got his first podium at Mallory and it's just been a domino effect really. Obviously, the sand GPs haven't went quite as well, but... I don't necessarily think that was down to his ride and he had a, few, a bit of bad luck on a couple of them. So it'd be interesting to see if he can get his, get his starts. I think if he gets his starts, he'll be fine as well. Another exciting addition is Liam Everts. He's going to be joining the World Championship. Fred will be his first World Championship event. Starting to make me feel old because I remember watching Stefan Everts' whole career. So now to have Liam do that at kind of around the similar age to what, what Stefan started, definitely starting to feel pretty old at this point. But very excited to see how Liam does. We've seen Kevin Horgwell be in around top 15 in the World Championship whenever he's done a wild card. We saw Rick Elzinger, more or less a top 15 guy in, in America. So are we expecting Liam to be about a top 15 rider at, at Riola this weekend? And again, it's great preparation for Mandeville for the, for the, the for motocross of nations. So I'm pretty sure that's been in their thoughts as to why they're going a wee bit earlier to the World Championship than they initially intended, which was going to be October. Yeah, it'll be good to see him race an MX2 GP. And I do believe, actually, he's going to be MX2 World Championship rider full-time next year. So I think that's also a reason behind him stepping up a little bit earlier than first anticipated. I think because it's sand, he'll be 10 to 15 mm-hmm. in around that mark. I think if it was hard pack, I'm not sure. It would probably depend more on the start because hard pack, uh, it's not... I think he's a better sand rider. He can obviously ride hard pack, but MX2 and hard pack this year, I feel like the top 20 is very, very strong. But Everts is a technical rider, so I think the sand will suit him. I'll go for between 10 and 15, maybe, which would be very good for his debut, I think. Yeah, and as you mentioned, the start's probably going to be a bit of an indication to his results as well. But if you can get the starts, certainly a 10 to 15 result isn't, isn't out of the possibility. And even if he gets a good start, just to get away even in that top five, that top ten, to see that pace. He doesn't have any pressure. It's all a learning, a learning experience. And maybe riding that MX2 will help prepare him for the for the Nations the week later. He'll maybe be less nervous because, let's be honest, the MX2 World Championship is a much deeper and higher quality field than what the uh, Motocross of Nations is going to be, especially this year. And even in, in every year with everyone moving about classes. So if, if he can show he has the speed and get the confidence up, for, for Raiola to show, put him in good stead for, for Team Belgium and the Motocross of Nations the, the week after, I think. Yeah, but I'm saying 10 to 15. What's your prediction? I'll go 12 14 for 13th overall. That's very specific. I'm impressed. Yes. All right, very I'll specific, say yeah. I'll stick with anywhere between 10 and 15. Like. That's very vague. I'm not impressed at all. Okay, we'll move to MX. <laughs> we'll move to, to MXGP. Oh, I had this conversation about Tim Geyser before Lommel. Would he would he play defensive or would he attack? And he attacked and fell off nearly every lap and still near ended up on the podium somehow. So how will he approach Raiola? He has a bigger point slate, but he has Jeffrey Herlings closing in on him now. How do you think Tim Geyser plays this? We know he's fast in the sand, but is it worth him risking everything to try and beat Herlings? Because we know Herlings and at this point Prado as well, also good in the sand and Caroli. They have to deliver it, Raiola. They have to beat Geyser in these points because there's less sand races coming up. And with Arco as well, now a triple GP header with the, the calendar changes. And even Mantova, Geyser's good there because it's not pure, pure sand. It kind of suits his hard pack sand co- combo ability that he has now. This is really the only venue left that's really going to favour Herdings, Geyser and Prado, you would think. Yeah, if I'm Geyser, I'm not too worried about beating Jeffrey this weekend. I think I would be happy with the podium. If Geyser gets a podium this weekend, Hurlings has a big problem, I think, in this championship chase, to be honest, because it's going to be hard to claw these points back. And a, po- a podium is absolutely fine, I think, for Geyser. And if he is to go all out and beat Hurlings, he might have to ride a little bit above his, his limit. And that can, you know, that can lead to him throwing the bike down the track which he can't afford to do because of DNF and Hurlings is going to get a bit of a lifeline. So I think if Geyser's just consistent this weekend and get a podium, I think even if Hurlings does go one one and sees Geyser on the podium with him, I think he'll be a little bit frustrated because I think he knows himself this is the weekend where he needs to gain as many points as he can. 
And obviously, if Geyser's on the podium, he's not going to gain much. And let's not forget, Hurlings himself has to just focus on, on doing what he does and going on one. That's not going to be particularly easy. We've got a motivated Crowley at the minute and a motivated Prado, who are very good in sound as well. And then you've got Fever that won at Lommel and Geyser, who has the speed as well. So it, it should be a fascinating GP. And added into them, you've Glenn Coldenhoff, who shown early in the season he can go in the sand. He's had quite a lot of bad luck recently. But saying everything goes well there and he gets the starts, he should be fast. Paul's Jonas good as well. So there are people like if things go well for Hurlings, if you're looking from, from that perspective or Crowley or Prado, there are guys that if guys are makes a mistake or is always slightly off his game or has even one bad moto, there's definitely riders that especially in the sand could maybe get in between between the, the title contenders. I think that's what everyone else is hoping for that doesn't call Tim Geyser this weekend. But Geyser, as we've seen, he's he's picked up his sand skills, so it's not like it used to be two or three years ago in the sand. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I had just mentioned the championship contenders there, really, when I was thinking of those riders. Um, But you're absolutely right. Kohlenhoff, even somebody like Bodgers, gets a good start. He has the capabilities to follow the guys. Jonas, the way he's riding, is very, very good. So... Even though Sands a bit easier to pass normally than hard pack, you're still going to need a start because the level in MXGP at the moment is very, very high, and it's you, it's tough at the front, it's tough at the top. <laughs> so it will really be interesting. I can't wait to see how it goes. Actually, to be honest with you, it's really good track. Really enjoy watching the International Talent Championship there. So it's it's good to see the circuit get a Grand Prix. Yeah, it's a brilliant track, and we saw in Lommel the excitement was was from the start of, of qualifying because we could see how intense Geyser was at trying to be fastest there. So I think we'll maybe get an indication of Geyser's mentality straight away. And, and Raiola, and obviously we haven't talked too much, but Prado, he had that DNA or no point score in the in the first moto in, in Turkey at the, the last round. So he has a lot of pressure to try and win or at least come close to victory and definitely beat Geyser. So a lot of motivation a lot of people thinking this is their chance to steal some points in Tim Geyser. So it'll be interesting, as you said, to see how Geyser responds and how everyone else deals with their opportunity, what they're perceived to be as the, the golden opportunity to try and make some big points on Tim Geyser. Definitely excited for that one. But Andy, thanks very much. That's all we have to talk about this this week. We'll be back after but, Raiola but with our thoughts on that before one. We'll go, you want to say? B- b- before you go, one name, who wins the MXCP overall, Raiola? The, the overall at Raiola, Hurlings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm going Hurlings too. <laughs> We're both going, I'm going to copy you. Well, that was incredibly boring. Thanks, thanks, <laughs> thanks for that, Andy. I'll speak to you next week. Uh, We're exciting. All the Bye-bye. best. Welcome to the Gate Drop Podcast. Gate Drop.com.